The Complete Grimm's Fairy Tales Thumbling There was once a poor peasant who sat in the evening by the hearth and poked the fire, and his wife sat and spun. Then he said, How sad it is that we have no children with us. All is so quiet, and in the other house it's so noisy and lively. Yes, replied the wife, and sighed. Even if we had only one, and it were quite small and quiet, only the big as the thumb, I should be quite satisfied, and we would still love it with all of our hearts. Now it so happened that the woman fell ill, and after seven months gave birth to a child, which was perfect in all its limbs, but no larger than the thumb. Then they said, It is as we wished it to be, and we shall call it shall be our dear child. Because of its size, they called it Thumbling. Though they did not let it want for food, the child did not grow taller, but remained as it had been at first. Nevertheless, it looked sensibly out of its eyes, and soon showed itself to be wise and a nimble creature, for everything turned out so well. One day, as the peasant was getting ready to go for into the forest to cut wood, when he said to him, as if to himself, how I wish there was someone who would bring the cart to me. Oh, father, cried Thumbling, I will bring the cart, rely on that, and it shall be in the forest at the appointed time. The man smiled and said, how could that be done? You are far too small to lead a horse by the reins. That's of no consequence, father. If mother will only harness it, I will sit in the horse, in the horse's ear and call out to him how he is to go. Well, answered the man, for once we will give it a try. When the time came, the mother harnessed the creature, or the horse, and placed Thumbling in its ear, and then the little creature cried, Giddy up, giddy up! And then it went quite properly, as if its master and the cart were right away into the forest. It so happened that just as he was turning the corner that the little one cried, Giddy up! The two strange men came toward him. My word, said one of them, what is this? There's a cart coming, and the driver is calling to the horse, and still he is not to be seen. That can't be right, said the other. We will follow the cart to see where it stops. The cart, however, drove right into the forest, exactly to the place where the wood had been cut. Then Thumbling saw his father and cried to him, Do you see, father, I'm here with the cart. Now take me down. And the father got hold of the horse with his left hand, and then with his right took his little son out of the ear. Thumbling sat down merrily on a straw, and then the two strange men saw him they did not what to say for their astonishment then one of them took the other and said listen little fellow would you you would make our fortune if we exhibited you in in a large town for some money we will buy him then they sent the peasant to the peasant said sell us the little man he shall not be treated he shall be well treated by us no replied the father he is the apple of my eye and all the money in the world cannot buy him by him from me. Thumbling, however, when he heard the bargain had crept up in the folds of his father's coat and placed himself on his shoulder and whispered to his ear, Father, do give me away. I will soon come back again. Then the father parted with him to the two men for a handsome sum of money. Where will you sit? He, they said to him. Oh, just set me in the rim of your hat and then I can walk backwards and forwards and look around the country and still not fall down. They did as he wished, and when Thumbling had taken leave of his father, they went away with him. They walked until it was dusk, and then the little fellow said, Do take me down. It is necessary. Just stay up there, said the man on whose hat he sat. It makes no difference to me. The birds sometimes let things fall on me. No, said Thumbling. I know its manners. Take me down quickly. And the man took off his hat and put the little fellow on the ground by the wayside, and he leapt and crept about and little between the little sods until he suddenly slipped into a mouse hole, which he had sought out. Good evening, gentlemen. Just go home without me, he cried to them and mocked them. Then he ran thither and struck through their sticks through the mouse hole, but it was all in vain. Thumbling crept still farther in and soon became quite dark. And there they were forced to go home with their vexation and their empty purses. When Thumbling saw they were gone, he crept back out of the subterranean passage. It's so dangerous to walk on the ground in the dark, he said, how easily a neck or a leg is broken. Fortunately, he stumbled against an empty snail shell. Oh, thank God. And in that I can pass the night in safety and got into it. Not long afterwards, when he was just going to sleep, he heard the two men go by and one of them was saying, how shall we set about getting hold of the rich pastor's silver and gold? I could tell you that, cried Thumbling, interrupting them. What was that? said one of the thieves in fright. I heard someone speaking, and they stood still listening, and Thumbling spoke again. Take me with you, and I'll help you. 
But where are you? Just look on the ground and observe from whence your, my voice comes. There the thieves at length found him and lifted him up. Oh, you little imp, how will you help us? Listen, he said, I will creep into the pastor's room through the iron bars and will reach out to you whenever, whatever you want to have. Come then, they said, and we will see what, what you can do. When they got to the pastor's house, Thumbling crept into the room, but instantly cried out with all his might. Do you want to have everything that is in here? And the thieves were alarmed and said, but do speak softly so as we are not to waken anyone. Thumbling, however, behaved as if he did not understood this, understand this and cried again. What do you want? Do you want to have everything that is in here? The cook who slept in the next room heard this and ran in bed into the bedroom and listened. The thieves, however, had in their fright run some distance away. But last they took courage and thought, the little rascal, rascal wants to mock us. And they came back and whispered to him, come, be serious and reach something out to us. Then Thumbling cried as loudly as he could. I really will give you everything. Just put your hands in. The maid who was listening heard this quite distinctly and jumped out of bed and rushed to the door. The thieves took flight and ran as if wild huntsmen were behind them. But as the maid could not see anything, she went to strike a light. When she came to the place with it, Thumbling, unperceived, betook himself to the granary, and the maid, after she had examined every corner, found nothing, lay down in her bed again, and believed that, after all, she had only been dreaming with her eyes open. Thumbling had climbed up among the hay and found a beautiful place to sleep in. There he intended to rest until day, and then go home again to his parents. But there were other things in store for him. Truly, there is much worry and affliction in this world. When the day dawned, the maid arose from her bed to feed the cows. Her first walk was into the barn where she laid hold of an armful of hay, and precisely the very one in which poor Thumbling was lying asleep. He, however, was sleeping so soundly that he was aware of nothing, and did not awake until he was in the mouth of a cow who had picked him up with the hay. Oh, heavens, he cried. How have I got into the fulling mill? But he was soon discovered where he was. Then he took care not to let himself go between the teeth and be dismembered. But he subsequently was forced to slip down into the stomach with the hay. And in this little room, the, the windows are forgotten, said he. No sun shines in, neither candle be brought in. His quarters were especially unpleasing to him. And worst was more and more hay was always coming in the door. And the space grew less and less. Then at length, in his anguish, he cried out as loud as he could, Bring me no more fodder, bring me no more fodder. The maid was just a, was just milking the cow when she heard someone speaking and saw no one and perceived that it was the same voice she'd heard in the night. She was so terrified she slipped off her stool and spilt the milk. She ran in the greatest haste to her master and said, Oh, heavens, pastor, the cow has been speaking. You are mad, replied the pastor, but he went out himself to the buyer to see what was there. Hardly, however, had he set foot inside when Thumbling again cried, Bring no more fodder, bring no more fodder. Then the pastor himself was alarmed and thought that an evil spirit had gone into the cow and ordered her to be killed. She was killed, but the stomach in which Thumbling was thrown on the, was thrown onto the dumb hill, and Thumbling had great difficulty in working his way out. However, he succeeded so far as to get some room. But just as he was going to be... Th thrust out from the head a new misfortune occurred a hungry wolf ran along and swallowed the whole stomach in one gulp and thumbling did not lose courage perhaps thought he the wolf will listen to what i have got to say and he called to him out from his belly dear wolf i know a magnificent feast is for you where is it to be had said the wolf in such and such a house you must creep through the kitchen sink and you will find cakes and bacon and sausage and as much as you can eat, and he described to him exactly his father's house. The wolf did not require to be told twice, and squeezed himself in at night through the sink, and ate to his heart's content in the larder. And when he had eaten his fill, he wanted to go out again, but he had become so big he could not go out by the same way. Thumbling had reckoned on this, and now began to make a violent noise in the wolf's body, and raged and screamed as loudly as he could. "'Will you be quiet?' said the wolf. "'You will waken these people.' What do I care, replied the little fellow. You have eaten your fill, and I will make merry likewise. And began once more to scream with all his strength. At length his father and mother were aroused by it, and ran to the room and looked in through the opening in the door. When they saw that a wolf was inside, they ran away, and the father fetched an axe and the wife a scythe. 
Stay behind, said the man, and when they entered the room, when I have given him a blow, if he is not killed by it, you must cut him down and hew his body to pieces. Then Thumbling heard his parents' voices and cried, Dear father, I am here. I am in the wolf's body, said the father, full of joy. Oh, thank God, our dear child has found us again, and bade the woman to take away her scythe, that Thumbling might not be hurt with it. After that, he raised his arm and struck the wolf with such a blow that his head fell down, and he fell down dead. Then he got knives and scissors and cut the body open and drew forth the little fellow. Oh, said the father, what sorrow has gone through us for your sake. Yes, father, I have gone through the world for a great deal, but thank heaven I can breathe fresh air at last. Where have you been then? Oh, father, I have been in a mouse's hole, a cow's belly, and a wolf's paunch. Now I will stay with you. And we will not sell you again. No, not for all the riches in the world, said the parents. And they embraced and kissed their dear Thumbling, and gave him much to eat and drink. And some new clothes were made for him, for his own clothes had been spoiled by the journey.